men are not working as much as they used to. Let's talk about it. Men have been steadily dropping out of the workforce, especially men aged 25 to 54, who are often considered to be in their prime working years. As of August 2024, 13.7% of prime age men were not working, compared to just 7.2% in 1954. The long-term decline in labor force participation by so-called prime age men is a tremendous worry for our society, for our economy, and probably also for our political system. There's a surplus of prime age workers who could be working and aren't, and that's this puzzling problem. The unemployment rate for prime age working men sat at 3.4% in August 2024. This number primarily includes those who are unemployed and looking for a job. But about 10.5% of men in their prime working years, or roughly 6.8 million men nationwide, are neither working nor looking for employment, compared to just 2.5% in 1954. Yo, those numbers, that's crazy. And this was back, I think they said, of August. And I know unemployment has dipped for September, but I am very curious on what this month, October, I'm curious on what the unemployment rates come in for this month, being the month before the election. But if you look at this decline here from, again, we're looking at the 50s when men who are not working and not looking for work, 2.5%. Now we're at 10.5%. 10% of the men in our population aged from 25 to 54 are currently not looking for work. I want to know is what, what the hell are they doing? How, how are they making money? How are they getting by? What's surprising is it's not a COVID phenomenon. It's not a recession phenomenon. And for every prime age man who is unemployed and looking for a job, there are more than three, in some years, four, who are neither working nor looking for work. So what's driving men out of the workforce? And if left unchecked, what impact will it have on the U.S. economy? Nearly half of prime age men out of the workforce cited obsolete skills, lack of education and training, poor work record or security issues as a reason preventing them from work. Education is a very important predictor of a prime age man's odds of being out of the labor force. The big impacts are on the non-college educated groups on their ability to enter and stay in the labor market. Men who are not so I'm curious if when we're talking about non-college educated, are they taking into account men who went through the trade route, went through, maybe still went to some sort of apprenticeship program, but not technically college educated? Because as we know, a lot of those guys who go that route become very, very successful, obviously, if you manage your money correctly through that time. But a lot of men are making decent wages especially in today's age, because we're starting to see a turnaround. And they're going to talk about it right here. College participation in men have been dropping over the years because, let's be honest, a lot of us are starting to notice that I think my kind of generation, the millennials, got the worst of it is we were going into college, taking on these student loans, being like, oh, you know, we'll pay them back whenever we get a job. And there was a large majority of people who went to college, took these student loans, and now they're still – not able to get a decent paying job to be able to one, keep up with the cost of living that's going on today in 2024, but also being able to keep up with the cost of their student loan payments and the other debt they probably acquired through that time. So that's the major problem here is you get a society who believes, again, this was back in our age where you ha either you went to college or you weren't going to be successful. I mean, I remember hearing that in high school. Everyone's like, where are you going to college? Where are you going to college? Oh, you're not going to college? You're not going to be successful. You're not going to make enough money to get by. That was the stigma back then. And I think times are starting to change a bit where that's no longer the case because the newer generation is seeing the struggles and the people who were not benefiting from going to college and still, you know, working at Starbucks or, you know, doing working at a, a grocery store, being a college educated individual. I think the problem is, is not going to college or not, it's the problem is if you go to college, securing a degree that's actually going to get you a decent paying job. But now, <laughs> again, this, this is, economy is nuts. Now we're seeing a bunch of college educated men in the tech atmosphere, the tech industry who are getting laid off. We're seeing buku amounts of men being laid off in the tech industry. 
So like, what is that saying? I'm telling you, it all comes back to <laughs> the trades. My good old blue collar boys. I mean, those are the guys that are going to make it. And I think, I think we're going to start seeing a big major turnaround. Maybe whenever my son, or probably before that, I would say. Yeah, probably before that. My son's seven. Probably before he even gets to college, if he even goes to college, we're going to see a big turnaround of, you know, wanting to be a content creator, drop shipper, whatever, to now wanting to be a plumber, an electrician, a carpenter, because that's something that you can't outsource to tech right now. I mean, maybe 50 years from now, I don't know what the technology will be like, but right now you can't outsource that. Like if I have a problem that I can't fix myself, I'm calling up a guy in the trades. I had to run electric down on my crawl space because I had to install a, a dehumidifier. I had to call somebody to do that. Like you got to have those boys. You got to have them. Not college educated leave the workforce at higher rates than men who are. At the same time, fewer younger men have been enrolling in college over the past decade. If you look at the geography of where the most prime age men on the labor force are in particular, they tend to be in places that have experienced manufacturing declines. They used to graduate with a high school education and have good, stable jobs. They weren't glamorous jobs. They were, you know, automobile factories, sometimes mines, other manufacturing jobs, but they were respected, they were stable, and they could support a family. Since then, due to... That sounds nice, doesn't it, man? <laughs> Having a just a, a decent job, like nothing crazy, but being able to support a family. The problem is right now in today's age, you can't really do that. Not many people are able to support a family because wages have not kept up with inflation. And a lot of people are struggling out there. I'd also like to see what happens if we start drilling for oil more. If we bring energy prices down here in America. I'd like to see what that does to society. We would be able to have more jobs kept here in America and be more you know, pro-America when it comes to buying our products here instead of buying cheap labor you know, over in, in China. I'd like to see what happens if that, that's an option. I mean, there would be so much opportunity if, if we went that route. Technology-driven growth, a little bit due to Chinese competition. You've had a lot of manufacturing firms and the places where they were located that, you know, that were one-horse towns become ghost lands, right? Wages could also be a contributing factor. Median annual wages for men with a high school diploma have fallen from just over $57,600 in 1973 wow, to $45,000 in 2023, Gosh. adjusted for inflation. At the same time, wages for those with a bachelor's degree or more have increased by about $6,300 during the same period. This decline in earnings led to a 44% growth in the exit rate of men without a college degree from the workforce between 1980 and 2019. I think, honestly, status plays more of a role than wages. As I said before, you had a manufacturing job, it was respected, you were part of a community, breadwinner for your family, you had organizations like unions or rotary clubs that surrounded your job, and that's gone. In general, men without children are all she makes a solid point there. Like a lot of men, and some of you may not agree with this, but a lot of men do take pride in what they do. Like that's when, when, when a man goes to work, like whatever he chooses to do, like that is his identity. I mean, some, some men may not agree. Like I, I lean more towards the side of like, it doesn't really matter what people think of you, but you still want to be proud of like what you do. Like the, the the famous question whenever you meet somebody on vacation or out in public whatever you know you know what's coming oh so what do you do you know like as a man you want to be proud of what you say for what you do for your career because let's be honest like that was <laughs> that makes up most of your life besides hanging out with your kids and, and, and your wife and stuff like what you do is that's your life and uh if there's no if there's no pride in that it's that's uh it's it's tough it really is so she makes a really good point that also less likely to participate in the workforce compared to men with children, especially men without education or training after high school. What we have seen is a huge rise in the proportion of prime age men who've never been married and a very, very significant decline in the proportion who are currently married and have kids at home. And those two trends track closely 
with the big changes that we've seen about male attachment in the labor force. Correlation isn't always causation, but looking at that correspondence is real important, I think. Meanwhile, 57% of the roughly 10% of men not looking for work said their physical or mental health was the main reason for not being employed, with 55% citing a disability, serious illness, and or receiving disability benefits. The whole question about the health and the mental health of male workforce dropouts is an extremely important and I think concerning one. Distressing proportion of the men who are out of the workforce say they're using pain medications every day. A 2017 research paper estimates that an increase in opioid prescription between 1999 to 2015 led to about 43% of the decline in men's labor force participation rate during that period. So then you have to ask, what sort of pain are we talking about? Are we talking about physical pain? Are we talking about metaphysical pain? There's an enormous amount of depression, mental health challenges that men in this uh, grouping face. Some of this is a chicken and egg question. Did you drop out because you were feeling sad or are you sad because you dropped out and you're living on the couch? Unemployment is really terrible for people's well-being. Often people adapt. Yo, that's a that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. I mention it every now and then here on the channel. I have a video I did like a year ago talking about anxiety and depression. And I, I suffer with anxiety a lot. And I think a lot of men back in the day suffered with anxiety, but no one really knew what it was. Like, I know my dad and my grandpa, both of them, struggle with it as well but we always just kind of coughed it up to you know uh, oh we're stressed like oh, oh it's stress but i actually started realizing like no maybe this is anxiety that's just something that's mentally <laughs> i don't know in my head when i started researching it a little more instead of just blaming it on stress i was like no maybe i really do have some sort of mental not i hate the word mental issue but like anxiety like I do, I, I know I suffer with it, but I also try to cope with it in certain ways, like through exercise, through diet, like those things really do help me a lot because the, the number one form of energy getting out of your body, because everyone has built up energy is through, for men is through anxiety. It's one of the easiest routes for energy to be released is anxiety in your body. And if you're not releasing that through physical exercise, that's going to cause more stress and more concern. I think another big problem with mental health nowadays is social media. You know, you go back 20, just 20 years ago, whenever social media wasn't really a thing. And then you go back 30, 40, 50 years ago, where our, our dads and our grandpas were in the workplace. Like I hate comparison, but let's be honest, that happens every single day when we're on social media to where rewind 50 years ago, you didn't have somebody, you know, flaunting them being on a private jet or, you know, whatever it is that men are craving and they don't get, but they see other men getting that really can have an effect mentally on men. It can. If you don't know how to cope with that or you don't know how to enjoy the life you are living currently, that has a very, very big effect. And then to mention something they talked about earlier as well is when it comes to men who are married with children versus single men, that's another big problem is social media is the dating scene right now is I, I watch these videos. I mean, I've been on a dating scene for <laughs> since I've been 19 years old, but what I see and what these men are experiencing is, is, is mind blowing. It really is crazy, and I feel for you single men out there, and I don't know what I would do in that circumstance because I know there's good women out there, but there's also this expectation of men and what you need to be like to be a a you know a true man you know got to be got to be six foot tall you got to be jacked out of your mind you got to be making a million dollars a year like let's be honest as a dude who's five foot nine like like that's not looking good for me you know like I'm a, a, it's just not that and I can see how mentally that could that could cause some issues for dudes I do and that's where it's tough like I mean, luckily I have a, a, a wife who loves me <laughs> for who I am, but, uh, you know, being in today's age, it, it's tough. It really is. And I think a lot of this all stems from being too connected with everyone in the world, social media. I think, I, I really think that's a major issue with what we're seeing in, in men today. After all kinds of negative shocks, losing a kid, being widowed, whatever, and eventually kind of come back, but long-term Unemployment is 
one of the worst things in, in terms of that. So what you have is a kind of scarring effect, and it's worse for men because their identity is much more wrapped up in their role as a worker. Men's declining workforce participation can potentially leave a lasting impact on the American economy. It means slower growth of the economy, obviously. It means bigger wealth gaps within our society. It certainly will have an impact on our productivity and probably already is. The U.S. has been experiencing a severe shortage in labor, still missing 1.7 million Americans from the workforce compared to February 2020. The McKinsey Global Institute estimates that U.S. GDP could have been $296 to $442 billion higher in 2023 if the country had been able to fill its job vacancies. However, some experts suggest the impacts of men leaving or never entering the workforce could be more sector-specific. You need young men coming in wanting to replace those people going out. And so if men have primarily been in more manual labor, more blue-skilled and skilled trades, if they're older and they're leaving in their retirement and there's not as many young men coming in, both because of declining cohort sizes, but moving in a different direction type of careers, we're going to be losing that sector of productivity. Despite a steep rise in federal funding, the infrastructure sector hasn't been able to find enough workers with the construction workforce shortage surpassing half a million in 2024. We are a little concerned about the impact and inflation is going to have and has had on the movement of infrastructure dollars into the actual productive activity. Having a shortage of men in construction is going to raise a problem. The trend could have a dire sociopolitical impact as well. It'll get worse in ways that we would not like. I mean, I think it would lead to more premature deaths, and but it will also likely lead to radicalization and polarization because this is a frustrated left behind group with no options. There are problems that government can address and problems. And what I think will cause or the effect of that to get more men to go to that industry is what I said earlier, higher wages. I mean, you got guys that are coming out of high school after their apprenticeship's over making, I mean, they could be making, I know whenever I was in construction, this was pre-COVID. We would work on certain projects. I was a you know project manager for, for a construction company. And whenever I'd put out my guys as laborers for who'd be doing the like labor and, and heavy equipment operator and stuff like that. I mean, after benefits and everything, these guys are making 50, 60 bucks an hour. I mean, that's, that's no chunk change. That's a lot of money. There may just be an education barrier of people not truly knowing how much you can make in the trades. So maybe we need, maybe there needs to be more emphasis on, Hey, this is what can actually like lifestyle that may bring you. Uh, if you come work in the construction industry or, you know, the trades. Problems that government can't address. One of the first functions that beats out policy is, you know, economic growth. You have a strong economy, you're going to have increased wage structure and it's going to bring people back into the market. More than a quarter of prime age men not looking for work cited insufficient pay as a reason preventing them from work. And nearly half said competitive pay, salary, compensation, and or bonuses was a very important factor when considering whether to enter or return to the workforce. For the young, better training, skills training, better post some form of post high school education, encouraging that, maybe even subsidizing that. I think part of the mental youth mental health crisis has to do with what's next? What's AI going to do? What am I going to do? Are there any stable jobs? I can't afford college. All those questions all come together. And so models that help them kind of give them a jump start can be really effective ways of intervening. And there are actually now really promising programs in high schools, which teach kids financial literacy. They teach them about equitable entrepreneurship. They teach them about how do you foster better mental health as part of the workplace. And it seems to inspire kids to go on to college, right? Because they sort of see a pathway where they didn't see it before. 29% of men out of the labor force said that training and educational programs was another important factor in considering a return to the workforce. Having the type of commitment from the employer 
to train and retain and offer upward mobility for workers, I think will be very important. Trying to figure out more about career pathways in the labor market and not just the education side. So how is it that someone moves from first job, next job to best job? How do we help people understand and navigate? That's a very good point too. As a man that's driven, you have, because there are some men out there that are just not driven. Like they aren't in the career, in their life or, or anything. But you do have, I think, a big opportunity for men that come into the workforce and have a career is showing them, hey, this is your starting path. This is where you're starting out at. But if you work hard, you do this, you do the right things, this is where you could end up. Like if there is a clear path of where you can go, you know, maybe you're coming in as a laborer and you want to become a supervisor or superintendent and you want to end up being a project manager in the office or whatever it is, there's steps you can get there to take that. That's where I think a lot of companies hinder is not having a clear path of where you can go in your future in your career. Because if you just show up and you're like, oh, I'm back at work doing the same thing I'm going to be doing for the next 30 years, like there's no opportunity, there's no viewership of showing the the worker where he can like what his true potential is in that career path, then yeah, there's no drive. There's no excitement. There's no reason to say, hey, I'm gonna get up and kick ass today at my job because I want to get to XYZ like there was a little bit more, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Nearly a quarter of working Americans said they weren't satisfied with their growth opportunities in the workplace. Compared to other OECD countries that on average spend 0.1% of their GDP on training their workers. The U.S. spent only 0.03% of their GDP on job training in 2022. Older age groups, it's tougher. You know, you're probably not going to get these guys to retrain. But you can get, there are a lot of programs that have largely been pioneered in the U.K. much more than here. But we're starting to pick up on them. That literally just try and reboot community activities. They get these isolated people in despair out of their houses. It can make a difference. Social programs like disability benefits spark contentious debate. It's very controversial. People have very strong opinions about this. While we don't know why it is happening, we can be pretty uh, clear that the social welfare programs are helping and the disability programs are helping to finance this uh, situation in a way that was never originally intended. A 2018 analysis by the Joint Economic Committee found that 64% of prime age men who aren't working were receiving some sort of government assistance. So the one benefit that they rely heavily on is disability insurance. One, because they often are unable to work if they have a physical injury or high levels of addiction or whatever, but it also provides health insurance, which is huge very much against the initial intentions of the founders of the program. They've ended up with a perverse situation that too often subsidizes or even incentivizes helplessness and long-term dependence. Yo, that's that's a real thing right there. Like that's something I have a problem with is whenever I go into the grocery store and, you know, I'm paying for two hundred dollars worth of groceries and then you see somebody in front of you who looks very capable of holding a, a decent paying job and then they're buying steaks, crab, you know, fudge rounds and Debbie cakes on EBT. That should not be the case. I'm sorry, but that should not be, you should not be able to getting free food from the government and then going and buying shit and expensive food. I'm sorry. And, and luxury item food, steak. I, 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 it shouldn't be like that. It really shouldn't. There should be a set amount of food, vegetables, fruit, and you know a, a couple of things of, of meat, the chicken, whatever it is, and and some eggs and milk. And that's kind of like your your necessities to get by and and live. Not being able to go all these processed junk food and whatever it is that uh, that these people are spending their their EBT money on. Um, and then they, like he was mentioning is with disability is these programs are making our society and our men weaker. Like we are a weaker society than we were 50, 60 years ago. And if you try to complain, if you try to disagree with me, like there's no no way you can say that our men are tougher today than they were 50, 60 years ago. No way. There's so many men out there who are on disability that you know can get up and work. 
Now there are disability and there are times where people need that, but I think these these welfare welfare type programs have gotten way too lenient, and there's also way too many of our tax dollars going to fund this that could be spent elsewhere benefiting our society in much better ways. If we thought about a system in which we had a work first principle where the incentives were for getting the training and then showing up at the job and then staying at the job, I think we'd be in a lot better place than we are today. However, some experts remain doubtful about whether altering the benefits program will lead to meaningful results. I think until we deal with the deeper problem of ill health, ill mental health, these guys aren't going to respond to incentives. Everybody is responsible for their, you know, for their brothers. Everybody's responsible for their neighbors and their friends. And you know, we ourselves as citizens can help to shine a spotlight on this. It, it shouldn't be America's invisible problem. And the more that we talk about it, the more that we pay attention to it, uh, the closer we get to turning this around. That was a good one. I'm curious to hear y'all's thoughts down in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Are you 50-50? <laughs> Let me know because uh, this this does need a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of things that could be changed. But unfortunately, it may get worse before it gets better. <laughs>